You're listening to Wastoids. Hey, you're listening to Wastoids, the podcast and video network from Hello Merch. I'm Brandon Michael from Hello Merch, and welcome to Wastoids with Laura Jane Grace. As a solo artist and leader of Against Me, she's created some of the most strident punk music of the last couple decades. She's currently embarked on the Carousel Tour, playing collaborative sets with Anthony Green of Circuit Survive and Tim Kasher of Cursive, along with special guests Mikey Erg, Home Is Where, and Oceanator on select dates. Check out Wastoids.com for tour dates, which include stops at the Liberty in Roswell, New Mexico, and one of our favorites, the Crescent Ballroom in Phoenix. Laura kept real busy during the pandemic and was a frequent DJ on Vans Channel 66, where she exclusively played music released post-2020. She also put out a killer EP, At War with the Silverfish, and was recently elected as a governor of the Chicago chapter of the Recording Academy, which is the Grammys in layman's terms. Laura sat down with me to chat about the challenges of touring in 2022, the 15th anniversary of Against Me's landmark album New Wave, what she's been listening to, and get into her habits, which include running, drinking absurd amounts of coffee, and dominating foosball tables nationwide. Let's get to it. This is Waystoids. This is Waystoids. This is Waystoids. This is Waystoids. Well, thanks for chatting with me and us and taking time out of your day to do this. Right on. Um, Thank you. So, I have a burning question. So Let's get to it. Oh, and I'm sorry. I should have referred to you as Governor Laura Jane Grace. Sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> um, congrats on that, by the way. Thank you. It's fucking weird, right? Yeah, pretty odd. Not surprising, but... Um, okay, so... I have to ask you if you got your Sonic the Hedgehog 2 tickets yet. <laughs> I haven't even got my Sonic the Hedgehog 1 tickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first one was really um, good. And when you, when you like, when I saw it, because I saw that you had just like straight up blocked it on Twitter, I was like, I get it, because I'm also on Twitter, and I'm like, the, like, the marketing and the promoting is like great, but it's like insane how much they've been pushing that. I, you know, it honestly, it had nothing to do with Sonic specifically. I just, uh, I don't know when it started with Twitter, but they, there's always sponsored ads in my feed now. Yeah. And immediately, no matter what corporation it is, I just block them. Oh, yeah. I block all sponsored ads it, with my goal of being eventually I will have blocked every single corporation on Twitter, which will probably put me into some weird shadow ban black hole <laughs> algorithm on Twitter, yeah. but is worth it for my mental sanity. I, you know, I did not see the first Sonic. I remember uh, hearing the controversy around like the original way they had him look, you know, yeah. the actual hedgehog and that it was not true to the video game. And then they corrected it. And uh, so that was my initial like, well, I'm not going to bother seeing that. But then I heard subsequently that Jim Carrey actually performed uh, or gave a pretty great performance, which I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll see it someday. And, um, you know, same thing for Sonic 2. Maybe I'll see it someday <laughs> as well. I do not plan on going to the movie theaters to see it, though. Yeah. But w when it is eventually streaming, I'm sure I'll watch yeah, it. Yeah, that was I think that was the last thing we saw, like before COVID popped off, because I I think Sonic 1. Sonic 1. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I think it came out. Right on. I think like Valentine's Day 2020. So, I mean, COVID was a thing, but it was like way, like a little bit before like the mask mandates sure. and everyone was taking it seriously. It was still when it was kind of like a joke. Yeah, kind of. We were like, <laughs> oh like, yeah, people are wearing yeah. masks, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, no, it was really good. And Jim Carrey was like incredible in it. But yeah, I thought maybe you had just beef with Sonic or something. I just had to. No beef with <laughs> Sonic. I, you know, I back in the day when uh when i was like saving up for a video game system and it was between the genesis and the super nintendo i went for the genesis just because of sonic nice. so i i grew up playing the the sonic video games and uh have been a fan and i'm a fan of jim carrey although i gotta say i don't really like his paintings and but uh I'm, <laughs> like, yeah i'm I glad like somebody else actor. said it i <laughs> so there, he has a couple pieces i'm like okay that's cool but some of them are a little yeah i don't know not my yeah, thing do it if it makes you happy oh, yeah. by all means jim but you know like yeah yeah it's cool he's passionate about it right all right so now we got the sonic beef out of the way we can talk glad we broke the yeah <laughs> so we can talk about the tour coming up 
Are you excited about it? Excellent. I am. I'm like uh, filled with tension and anxiety um, and uh, excited, but kind of also trying to hold the excitement at bay just because at this point, you know, tours being canceled and such are so commonplace that like there's a part of me that won't let me get too excited about making future plans. But literally right before I signed on to this, I'm, you know, in a group chat with uh, Tim Kasher and and Anthony Green and we text each other all day long. And uh, I hope that continues even after the tour is done. Yeah, no, I, I totally get that. Like it's like right now, times are still kind of weird. Even a couple years after, it's like yeah. hard to get stoked for anything because you're like, yeah, like, anything could still happen. Like, my favorite restaurant could shut down, or like you said, the tour could get, you know, nixed or whatever. But I was supposed to go to Canada in September, um, and that got postponed. Or sorry, I was supposed to go to Canada in March, and that got postponed till September. And that was supposed to be my first tour back yeah. really you know like first proper tour i've been out playing like one-off shows you know one or two a month since like last august but that was the first tour and that got having that be postponed was like again you know reeled it back in my excitement yeah i was like just don't hold your breath about anything right until now. it happens then you can get excited about it yep um so how have you been like preparing for this tour um have like have you had like a different approach other than maybe like making sure you don't get COVID before hitting the road, but has your like approach been different to like preparing for even just playing shows? Well, it has specifically even just in that the, in what I think we're trying to do with this tour, you know, like, um, like each leg of the tour has a, has a different opener between Mikey Erg and Oceanator and home is where, right. And then with me and Tim and Anthony, while each of us have our own individual sets, we'll be playing, you know, Um, like within those sets, we're trying to do collaborations with each other. Right. Um, So like Tim will come up and sing one of my songs with me, you know, like we were texting earlier about doing black my song black me out together. And then like I'll or I'll go up and I'll do a song with Anthony during Anthony's set or something like that. And then in addition to that, Megan, who plays cello and cursive, they're going to come out and they're going to, you know, accompany all three of us at different points. And then my friend Alex Kearns, who plays in the band La Maria, they're going to come out and they're playing drums on the tour. And so they'll be playing drums with each of us. So it's just kind of trying to figure out like the approach to the sets in that way to try to make it collaborative, even though it's individual sets. Um, so that, you know, just by its nature has meant not just practicing your my own songs but also practicing anthony's songs and practicing tim's songs yeah and uh i was joking about it in the group text a second ago where i was like i think each of us need to learn a lesson in being less verbose lyrically within our songs out of a courtesy for other people who may potentially learn our music because all three of us write way too many damn lyrics (laughs) in each song need better word economy yeah especially cursive like like I'm, I'm, I like cursive. Like I, I was never like a cursive fan, you know, like I never got super into them, but like, I love like from the hips is like one of my favorite songs. Um, and Amazing. yeah, like yeah. a lot of his stuff is like, it's really, really wordy. It's great though. Like it's not a bad thing, but it's, he's, he's brilliant. Tim Castro is brilliant. And like to even know him in any capacity for me is like, I, I have to pinch myself sometimes. Like, the second against me tour we ever did uh, was four of us crammed into my Buick LeSabre, right? And it was, yeah, it still had a cassette deck. That's what we had. <laughs> so it was a bunch of, you know, dubbed tapes. And one of those tapes had the first two cursives al- cursive albums on it. And we just listened to it and listened to it and listened to it. And Domestica as an album had such an impact on me. And then the Ugly Organ in particular, and with the song like Art is Hard, oh. you can like, I could just like directly draw lines between that album and the Against Me album, Searching for a Form of Clarity. Like I was trying to do what Tim did with that album with searching for a form of clarity as like a critique on the music scene and on on art in general as an industry and um then even continuing on with that 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 uh the good life record that tim did album of the year uh as a concept record just to me was mind-blowing and there was a period of time where i was continually trying to do concept records that had similar flows to it and uh i just have always admired them as a writer um what have you been listening to lately um, let me see. Yeah, uh, check this I'll tell you, there's this, uh, 
What's you gotta that? check the Spotify <laughs> search history really quick. Well, you know, it's like that question where you like you walk into a record store and you're all of a sudden you're like, I don't know what kind of listen, music I listen to. What do I yeah. like? <laughs> and your mind immediately goes blank. Um, I've been listening to uh, this artist named Peter Lake recently. They've put out like two or three EPs. Um, and there's this song called Sugar It Lightly that I became obsessed with. And um, been listening to this band Gel. Uh, I think they're from Philly. I saw them play at this venue in St. Louis called The Sinkhole recently. Like, thrashy, grindcore, awesome, just angry punk rock. Um, have been listening to this band called Matiel. I think I'm pronouncing that right. M-A-T-T-I-E-L. They're from Atlanta. And um, some of their music's kind of like throwback sounding, but like lyrically and just like the intelligence behind it is like so refreshing and so awesome. Uh, I've been listening to a little bit of Dwight Yoakam and nice. some Patti Smith and then um, some John Prine and uh, this artist called Carol's Daughter. There's this song called Violent that I'm I'm kind of mildly obsessed with. And um, then uh, there's also like this, uh, this, this person on Instagram that, you know, I, I kind of got in introduced to because I, I like ragged on them for a second. <laughs> And then they like called me on it and I realized like, oh, I, I am being a dick right yeah. now. And then like, and then I went and listened to their music and I was like, I kind of love this and realized I also love their mental approach to things, but their name's Kane Kerner. And like, they have this Instagram channel that's all just them like serving up some PMA, you know, and talking about real life lessons. Yeah. And, and they're like, they have a knife and they're always cutting up dragon fruit and eating <laughs> the fruit. And I think what originally like kind of made me turned off to it was just how sincere it is and like when they're talking to you they're kind of giving you bedroom eyes you know yeah. and uh but once i got past my own inhibitions i realized that i really appreciate them and then um lastly also this artist called rosie carney and uh jamie wyatt as well so you're all over the place yeah, yeah. No, that's yeah. rad um and and you know a lot of that is is just even the residual effect of doing those van set of continually being out there looking for new music but i i do have like an insatiable appetite for it where i just i like listening to music i listen to it all day long and i once i listen once i find something i like i, I burn myself out on it and then i'm like all right i need something else um new wave has a birthday coming up right 15 yeah yeah, yeah 15 <laughs> sure. so do you have like any memories like do like, you have any like memories that stand out about making that record or even touring it or any of it yeah you know and it's it's funny you ask that specifically even just because uh the the first tour we did after recording the record just prior to it coming out was uh the tour with mastodon and cursive oh. so that was my first time touring with tim Kasher. and uh there's a couple of the venues on this tour that i remember from that or couple of the venues on this upcoming tour that i remember from that tour um but you know it that that record was such a uh, a kind of yin and yang experience where the recording of it was a dream like no other experience i've had before really fulfilling learned so much really got lucky with like butch in particular and billy who engineered and like uh Everything about it was reco recording. It was great. And then the second we started touring on it, it all became a nightmare. Oh, no. <laughs> it was a terrible experience. So it was really just like a stark contrast with that. Um, and maybe some of that Mastodon tour, cursive tour had to do with that, where we set ourselves up for disaster to uh, not get too into it. But um, those were definitely hard partying days. And I probably took about a decade off of my life on that initial tour. So to have the tour that was right before the record come out be one that um was that much of burning the candle at both ends was probably not a great idea yeah uh but uh but yeah you know it, it was an interesting experience and it was also like really um there was also a stark contrast between the record being like it was really uh well received like critically you know like got a lot of praise like it was spins album of the year and stuff like that but then the like sales were disappointing to the record label so the it was like us being like yay and the record being like record label being like you could have done better yeah <laughs> so it was just kind of a strange experience like that you know? yeah that was actually the first the first record that i heard by against me um because i was actually just telling jason earlier i'm i'm a huge alkaline trio fan and i think Word. around 
when that came out, I think it was a little bit after Crimson came out. We had toured with Alkaline Trio while writing for New Wave. We did that tour in 2000, April of 2006. So toured with Alkaline Trio a- April of 2006, and then we were recording New Wave by like September or October or whatever. Okay. So um, there was a couple songs written on tour or written for New Wave that came about on tour with Alkaline Trio even. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think... At Crimson came out around that yeah. yeah i remember being in um in high school like my math class was like a computer it was on computers um, which was like kind of dumb because i would just watch music videos during class <laughs> and i think um the video for thrash and real i think is the video that popped up randomly and then i was, that was like, the first one from the album okay so, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so yeah that came on and i was like this is fucking rad and then that just kind of like change like skyrocketed like i just started listening to you guys and like alkaline trio and then a couple of other bands but that's that's like the record that introduced me to you guys so i had to ask about that's it that's cool i'm glad you were able to i'm glad you were able to look past uh that video's fault <laughs> still see you still appreciate the song because yeah. I, I look at that video sometimes with extreme embarrassment and you know that that making that video was like as an experience was kind of emblematic of a lot of the experiences around that record you know where we would go into it with the best intentions and then find out we were in situations where we're like, Oh wait, this kind of sucks. Yeah. You know, like, um, I remember a particular with making that video where like, you know, it was shot in a day and there was one point during the day where the director had arranged for themselves to be interviewed and they were like lying on a leather couch <laughs> being interviewed about the video that wasn't even finished being made and we're all sitting there freshly having our skin dyed red because we'd gotten fake wine poured yeah. on us for a couple hours straight and we're like looking at them being like what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you fucking ha- jerk you should start doing interviews like that just be like on a couch just and then like you pop up like as you imagine <laughs> Right. Well, you know, if I did it, though, I, it would be tongue in cheek and it would be funny. Yeah. You know, they were like dead serious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've, if I do more podcasts like this, I want to interview people like that now and just lie on the couch <laughs> and just be like, hey, what's up? And then make it all focused about you. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> ask people to be the guests, but ask them nothing about themselves. Just like talk about yourselves at them. I've done legitimate podcasts like that, you know, where you're like, why do you even need me here? You're just telling me your opinion. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I haven't done that. I hope I haven't talked about me no, too no, much. No, 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 cool. No, no. Um, no. <laughs> so do you have any, um, like any rituals that you do like before the DJ sets or just before a show or do you just kind of just take a deep breath and go out there. Or... Yeah. You know, um, I kind of have like daily rituals in general, um, or I guess practices would be more accurate yeah. rituals or practices. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's incredible. Actually, like, uh, the past year I've made a concerted effort where I'm like, I'm going to do at least 15 minutes of guitar scales every day. And just even seeing like the difference in dexterity I have with my fingers from doing guitar scale warm ups is like night and day where I'm like, I should have been doing this for a long time. Yeah. Um, but you know, before a show, directly before a show, I do vocal warm ups. So like thirty minutes at least of just running scales and you know, that's something that definitely when I was younger, um, I would have felt way too embarrassed to ever have done backstage around anybody. <laughs> Um, and then there's this switch that happens eventually in your life where you're like, I'm not doing this to impress anybody. I'm doing this out of necessity yeah. because I need to warm up my voice in order to be, to be able to sing every night. Um, so there's that. But in general, like, um, I just, you know, I like before a show to make sure like that, like an hour before set time that everyone who's going to be on stage is like kind of in the same space, you know, and like put on some music and whatever laugh tell jokes just hang out together but not you know sometimes there there tends to be a cycle of like if you're traveling all day you get to a venue everyone kind of breaks off a little bit and does their own thing and you need to bring it back together right before the set to get like the kind of group atmosphere going and get in the show mentality and everything and you know you you write a set list and stuff like that and change into show clothes or whatever yeah. and, and those kind of small things that are all part of the ritual part of the practice yeah um do you like to kind of walk around the city or the like of wherever you're playing or do you kind of just like to 
get like stay on the bus or get into a room and just kind of like walk in and get your stuff ready i like to go running uh i'm an avid runner um i love to run every day if possible and i found that that's my favorite way to actually explore a city <clears throat> and um ideally what i like to do is wake up first thing in the morning and go on a run wherever i'm at just pick a direction and like set a timer and be like i'm gonna run 20 minutes that way and then i'll have to run 20 minutes back you know and just going out and seeing a place like that is is pretty rad um sometimes you get more lucky than uh, you know others where you're you know sometimes a venue's in the middle of nowhere and you're like oh there's nothing around here yeah. but other times you're you're there's stuff around and you can go and, and explore but that's part of the joy of touring and traveling is is checking out new places and seeing new things. And um, that never gets lost on me, never gets old to me. Um, but any time I've been in a rut where I haven't done that, that's when like mental health starts to decline yeah. and, and it's not good. You know, when you just isolate and you stay on the bus or you stay locked away backstage, that's not. Yeah. Happening. Have you always been like into running or is it something that you just kind of picked up in the last few years or? I got into running probably when I was like 25 and that was the first time in life where I like sobered up or whatever and, and was like I'm gonna get healthy and uh, the block party record silent alarm I will f forever think is the best running record there's something about whatever BPM all the songs yeah. are at uh, that's perfect at least for me and my length of legs and everything like that and uh, the arc to like the first six or seven songs really has a great like uh by the time banquet hits you're like i'm in the zone yeah. I'm fucking running you know like um but uh you know i i started running then and then uh was really into it until like early 30s and then i kind of like hit some hard trouble like mentally in life and had some things going on and uh you know was like smoking cigarettes and drinking a lot and got out of running and then what pulled me out of it again when i was like 34 35 was running you know i i just started running again and what i really love about it is that you you just need some running shoes and some clothes that you don't mind getting sweaty yeah you know sometimes like what holds people back from getting into like physical fitness is like i don't want to get a gym membership i don't want to go to a gym and be around a bunch of boneheads <laughs> you know like who are all like juicing and pumping yeah. weights and I get that, you know, but with running, you can do it really mobily anywhere. And I just love the satisfaction or knowing that like, no one can take it away from you after you've done it other than yourself and your own bad habits. Yeah. Like you do it or I do it and I feel good, you know? And then it also like directly relates to even making me a better stage performer and that it's, um, it's, it's physical or it's uh, aerobic exercise, you know? So like as a singer, um, that was something that I always struggled with starting out, especially when I smoked cigarettes of like, and having a lot of lyrics where it was like, Oh my God, I'm out of breath <laughs> trying yeah. to sing all this. So, you know, you go out and you go running and, and you're just better physically able to perform on stage. Yeah. And I think, I think you touched on it. Like, it's cool too, that you can literally do it anywhere. Like you don't need a, a membership. Yeah. Like you can just go, just put on a record and just go wherever. Right. Right. And then like, you know, you, and, and you can, even it's, if it's you're like, you're having a hard day and you're like, I need to walk a little bit and walk a little bit, yeah. you know, like it's, there's no rules. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, silent alarm. I have to like, anytime someone brings it up, I just have to like, kind of talk about it for a second. It's to me, it's like, it's a perfect record. Like it's, it's on my Mount Rush, my, my Mount Rushmore of like records. A hundred percent. Yeah. And also then relating that to new wave, uh, Rich Costi, who mixed Silent Alarm, mixed New Wave. And part of that was because I was such a fan of Silent Alarm. And it was amazing working with Rich because afterwards I realized how much of Silent Alarm could be attributed to him sonically. Like a lot of the, like, ah, yeah. like, type moments in the songs or weird things like that. That's Rich, you know? Yeah. And if you listen to like the ocean off of New Wave, especially in the breakdown part at the end, there's like a lot of weird sonic things that happen. That's all rich, you know, like that's like him leaving his mark on it yeah. and uh, was really cool to experience. And again, that's the connection between silent alarm and new wave. Okay. I'm going to have to go back and listen to that song now. Like, yeah, that record, it's <laughs> like, yeah, it's unreal. That, that was like one of the first like indie or whatever records that like I listened to in high school and just kind of like changed my, my life. 
Um, so fantastic. Crowd. Yeah. So, um, aside from running, um, like, did you, did you pick up any like hobbies or anything in the last few years over the, the pandemic or during COVID? Um, not necessarily new hobbies. You know, I've always been an avid reader. And um, if anything, over the pandemic, my reading uh, input has increased significantly. Um, and then writing as well, you know, like even as not just music writing, just like journaling and stuff like that. Over the past couple of years, I've written a lot more. I've read a lot more. Um, and, you know, those are... In, in thinking about them as hobbies, even though I kind of most of the time view them as different things or whatever, or like what's the difference between hobbies and practices or practices and rituals and stuff like that, you know, like it's pretty, it, it's a f pretty full plate as far as like going running, writing every day, reading every day, practicing the guitar every day, working on vocal scales yeah. every day. Um, I wish I had time for like a martial art or something like that. Or I, you know, I, I legitimately early today, earlier today, I did a search uh, where I was like looking for places that teach, teach sword fighting. <laughs> <laughs> something just popped into my head this morning where I was like, I wish I knew how to use a katana. Um, so I don't know. It's not too late, right? No, you should. That'd be so funny if you just became like an expert at like sword combat, but like didn't tell anybody or, or yeah. same with like, like martial arts or something. If you just like, were just training and becoming like a black belt and didn't tell anybody and then just show I it off. Bust that yeah, out. just show it off at like random times. Totally. <laughs> my one, my my may, maybe my only kind of like similar thing to that is like I'm a world class uh, foosball player. I love foosball and like not to brag, but I'm pretty good at it too. So like I will hustle people on foosball tables, and like I feel like that's my like true secret hidden talent. Where sometimes I'll play people, and they're like damn you know, like you just kicked my ass at foosball you ever like hustle people oh all the yeah. time you know actually back to the new wave tour uh when uh when we were touring on the new wave album uh, warner or the label was like we want you to do meet and greets right and uh like especially we did a tour with the foo fighters for three months and they wanted us to do meet and greets every day and we're like all right well we'll do that but you have to buy us a foosball table because that's what we'll do. We'll play the fans at foosball. <laughs> and the rule with foosball is that if you don't score any points, you have to crawl under the table, kind of like an, a, a, a second humiliation yeah. <laughs> after being beaten. So every day we would just play fans and we would annihilate them and make them all crawl under <laughs> the table. <laughs> it was super fun. Where'd your love for, fo for foosball start? Uh, touring in Europe. You know, uh, especially when we started touring in Europe, uh, playing squats and stuff, there'd always be a foosball table or kicker, as they call it yeah. over there. And, uh, you know, Germans in particular are like so good at kicker and foosball. And us as Americans, we didn't know what we were doing. But, you know, with a language barrier there being there oftentimes, like, you know, we would hang out and just watch people play foosball. And then we started playing it and we would just get our asses kicked for years. But we'd come back to America and realize by like American standards were actually pretty good. You yeah. Know? <laughs> like, and so it was just like that training of touring in Europe and playing foosball for hours. And then, and then eventually like we got our own table and we tour with our own table and then it just carried on from there. Did you have it like on the bus? Is it like a retractable it, one? Like on the side of the bus, it just comes out. <laughs> no, it's kind of even better. We had like a road case built for it. <laughs> and so it like the legs would fold up underneath it and you'd set it in the road case and the road case would like travel on its side. And it looks like you're bringing in a mixing console. <laughs> so like every day the venue would be like, oh, you're touring with your own console. And we'd be like, no, 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 no. It's a foosball <laughs> table. It's <laughs> way better. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. How do you take your coffee? So on the, the last, so your like most, my heart. Yeah. Your most recent EP. Um, you have that song day old coffee. Do you ever actually drink day old coffee? I do all the time. Actually. Um, I'm, I, I love coffee. I think it is my own most unhealthy vice though. And it's an addiction that I realize I need to address and, and to do something about this point because I, I drink it in such a quantity that I think it's contributing to bone density loss at oh. this point. Um, but I like espresso. I'm after the caffeine, not all that liquid. Yeah. I don't want to have to be peeing all day <laughs> yeah. long. Uh, but so my jam is a quad shot of espresso. I like four shots of espresso. And I'll usually have like 12 shots of espresso a day. Uh, but 
but I've been campaigning to get the quad shot of espresso universally known as a Porsche. I want to, I want it to be that, that to be the name of the drink. I want to be able to go into a cafe and be like, I'd like a Porsche and to know that, and for them to know that I mean four shots of espresso <laughs> with no sugar and no cream or anything like that. I like, I just, my, my fiance drinks, she's a quad shot gal. And I, my heart would explode if I had that. Like I just recently got to two shots. Like I can have two shots and not want to like lose my mind and die. But, um, I, yeah, I can't imagine for, I'm going to let her know the Porsche thing though. And I'm going to tell her to start ordering that at places she might get. They'll be like, what? Yeah. And you'll be like a Porsche. Yeah. She'll be like, it'll catch on. Yeah. And then I have, I can, I, Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, I can literally like, I can drink a quad shot of espresso and take a nap immediately afterwards. It does not even phase. Yeah. Me. No. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to me and to do this. Um, I really can't wait to see you on tour. We'll stop by and say hi. Have a great day. Thank you. And I'll see you soon.